All right, everybody. Here we go. Here we go. You know the drill of how this works. The first couple minutes, always a little awkward. Boom, we got the Facebook notification. We are live. We are live on the Facebooks. We are live on the Facebooks. Well, that's very exciting. Because uh, that's what we want to see. And let's see. Looks like Twitch. Twitch is live, too. Still trying the Twitch. Still seeing if that can work. And we are live on the Rockfin. Joining us on Rockfin. So, now that we're live on all the things, took a, th th that was a little faster than usual, huh? <laughs> I'm usually waiting a little bit um, for these to show up in the beginning of these things. So that was a little faster. All right. All right. Not bad. Not bad. I was a little concerned. Uh, looks like we're, we're, we're live and ready to go. And you guys know the drill in the very beginning of the podcast for audio listeners, people that listen to this podcast uh, in the audio version that don't join us on the live streams. Just a quick reminder. We go live. Uh, I go live on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at around 1230. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit earlier to, to like mosey past the awkward sharing and check-in phase that I know some people, you know, don't really wait around for, but, uh, but here we go. We're, we're, we're doing it a little early. So if, if the audio listeners feel like they want to join the live stream and be a part of the conversation that way, uh, that's, that's where they can do it. And right now, uh, you know, it's usually YouTube Rockfin and Facebook right now we're, uh, Rockfin Twitch Facebook because of the YouTube censorship that I have talked about pretty regularly and would like to remind people again of, uh, so I always try to push people over to the Rockfin more than anything else because they are a blockchain crypto site that is, uh, primarily built on, Ensuring that content creators can earn money off of the content that they create and generate. Uh, but more importantly, they also don't censor. Um, they, they don't they don't censor alternative thought. They don't censor independent media. They, they encourage that sort of stuff um, as long as you're not, you know, calling for calling for extremist violence, which is which is the topic of today's uh, today's podcast. So uh, if you're interested in this, please hit that like button. Please hit that share button. Get the word out there. Let some people know that this is what we're talking about today. And um, join us. Join us in the stream. Do, you know, come come hang out with us. It's always it's always nice when there's more people leaving comments. And all that fun stuff here. Uh, so I'm going to do my shares. I encourage you guys to do the same thing. And while I'm doing my shares, uh, the usual drill is to, to do a little bit of a check-in about how, how we're doing in terms of mental health, physical health, so on and so forth. Uh, so I would encourage you guys to do the same if you feel comfortable with doing that, uh, you know, tell me how you're doing, tell me a project you're working on or, or, or something fun in your life or, or, or whatever, you know, how, however you feel like you want to uh, participate in this uh, live stream would, would be great. And, you know, comments are always encouraged as long as they're not hateful, mean, or, uh, or, or just downright shitty. Sometimes, sometimes people get shitty. It happens very, very rarely in these. And I discourage the shittiness uh, because we're all here to have a conversation you know, we're all here to share our perspective, share our point of view, um, and hopefully engage in some uh, in some rational discourse. That's the goal. Uh, to do a little bit of a check in here, uh, I'm not I'm not doing too bad myself. Doing okay, you know. Uh, uh, my my sinuses are going up and down, up and down, based on the based on the weather. It was it was really really warm the last couple of days, and then last night the temperature dropped again here, which. Uh, which meant my sinuses had no idea what the fuck to do. Uh, so I've been, I've been, <laughs> I've been rebattling the sinus, uh, the, 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 the sinus issues there. Um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm taking some more sinus medication, uh, getting back into the workout mode. I haven't really done a lot of working out in the last two weeks Last two weeks got kind of busy, kind of crazy, so uh, I, I fell off the workout train, but I'm back on it. Figured out a nice schedule for the week of working out. Uh, you know, 
I we changed up our schedule in early February. I think late January, early February, changed up our schedule. Uh, and you know, our weekends got shifted a little bit. So it was it was a little little tough to uh keep up with keep up with the workout schedule that I I had uh over the summer and now I'm trying to get back into it. So right now I can I can definitely do like four days out of the week. I would like to do five, but five might be a little difficult. Eventually if if, if you know things work out, I can add a fifth day to it. But right now it looks like what I'm trying to do is Thursday, Friday and Sundays and Mondays to be the workout days. Uh, you know, sometime in the evening usually is when I can get my workouts in. Um, and it feels good. Like I feel, I feel pretty good. I, I like, you know, I have that muscle soreness that you get from working out. Uh, it, that feels kind of nice. And like, I, I'm, I'm, tr I'm, it's encouraging me to be a little bit more physical and, uh, be more active around the house. Um, so that is, that is the, the thing that I'm, I'm trying to focus on. I've also decided like, Friday evenings, one of the things for me, I'm I'm definitely an introvert. I definitely find uh, like I recharge through, um, you know, uh, self-reflection and being alone. And, you know, for the most part of the day, I am alone. I, I'm, you know, I'm alone in the house. I do these, these streams and I get to be by myself. But that's that's work time. I'm not really um, taking the time to do something that I uh, really like and really enjoy. And, you know, uh, a couple weeks ago I had a, um, an afternoon interview. So I was able to do a stream and then pop over to this interview. It was, a, it was unfortunately not a good interview, uh, not on my end, but, uh, just in, in, in terms of the, the company and I won't, you know, I'm not gonna, uh, go into full details of, of all of that sort of stuff, but it just wasn't a comfortable environment for me to be in. And I got home and I was kind of feeling, uh, down and kind of poopy about things. So I just threw on a couple episodes of Yu Yu Hakusho, which is an anime that I was rewatching, um, and is one of my favorite animes to watch. Uh, there, there's, there's some parts of it that don't hold up. And then there's some parts of it that, that like, the parts that don't hold up, the explanations for why they don't hold up, even in that time, were like really well done. Uh, so I really enjoyed that show, uh, you know. So I, I took some time to just sit and relax and make a drink, um, and uh, and enjoy this anime. And I, and I and I think I'm gonna try to do that once a week on Fridays, on Friday afternoons. You know, I'm gonna try to make Friday like a lighter day where I'm not working. <laughs> <laughs> you know, between eight and eight and 13 hours um, in order to get all of my stuff done. I'm going to try to clock out around four, you know, make a drink, relax. And, you know, and one of the things I haven't really been able to do, which is um, sit down and listen to some music. I, I haven't been able to do something like that. Uh, and I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to try to do that on Fridays enjoy some new albums, you know, there's, uh, and, and just kind of chill out for an hour and a half to two hours, uh, before, uh, I have time with friends and with my girlfriend, uh, you know, uh, so that is something that I'm trying to focus on as well is, um, with how busy the last couple weeks got, uh, and, and, uh, you know, there is a lot of catch up that I've been doing and I'm still kind of catching up on a few things here and there, uh, with the last few weeks, uh, with how busy that got, I really didn't get time to take uh, for myself. You know, I, I, I didn't get the opportunity to um, just do something for me. And uh, and that kind of felt, uh, I don't know, not great. I, and I think it puts me in a, in a funk and it and it stresses me out a little bit more and I and I have a harder time um I have a harder time relaxing when that sort of stuff happens so uh yeah so I'm I'm making it I'm making that a little bit of a priority here a little bit of a priority here for myself uh and I hope you know you're you're taking the time to do something that you love throughout the week as well so uh, you know, kind of lead by example kind of kind of thing there. Uh, I'm going to share the Rockfin out uh, now. 
so that folks know that we're live and then we will and then we'll jump right into it folks so give me a few moments to get the rock fin in we'll finish up our announcements and then we will jump right into it uh i see a few folks are popped into the uh into the rock fin chats as well uh good to see you folks uh a dingo ate me baby and wm you guys are there i see you guys there thanks for tuning in thanks for saying hi uh and hang hang tight for just a moment and we'll we'll dive into the the big heavy topic of the day <laughs> as as it usually is right the the topics that i talk about tend to get heavy but that's okay uh i i think you know i've i haven't really heard any complaints about um oh boy chris your your topics are a little too uh, a little too heavy uh so I think go AB baby Chris uh, go anime one.com free latest anime subbed and a big library of older shows. No shit. Well, thank you for sharing that link. I'm a, I'll, I'll definitely have to check that out. Yeah. I'm a big, I'm a big anime fan. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get my girlfriend into, into some of the, uh, the animes that I watched. She got me into attack on Titan, which is a fantastic show. If you haven't seen it, uh, really, really well written. It's very captivating. Uh, and I resisted that show for a very long time, and uh, and that was foolish because it's a really really fun show. The problem is I'm I'm really bad with dubs because I have to read, um, and when I ha when I have to read the subtitles, I miss what's going on with like the main you know th the the visual aspect of things. Like I'm very bad at that, so uh, I am waiting for the dub of season four to come out, which I think is is leaning towards the end of uh, the conclusion of the show. Uh, so, uh, thank you for that link. I appreciate that. But, uh, last but not least, I want to mention that, uh, we're, uh, you know, if you want to financially help the show, if you're on stable financial ground, you do want to help the show, you can do so by going to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. Uh, you can make a one-time donation, which acts as super chats. Another thing that acts as super chats is on Rockfin. If you leave a tip for the channel, if you leave a tip for, uh, the channel is uh, is a great way to to help out. But if you're only if you're on stable financial ground, uh, and if you're on uh, super stable financial ground, and you want to leave uh, and you want to become a sustaining member, make monthly contributions. There's various ways to do that uh, on the website, uh, and you can also choose to become a subscriber on Rockfin. Uh, rockfin.com slash Chris Mohan haha become a subscriber, uh, and and you get pretty much everybody's premium content. Uh, these streams, when they're when they're streamed, are available for free, and then eventually become uh, premium. A, d a day later, they become premium content. Uh, so that's how I'm putting up premium content here on on the Rockfin. Uh, and uh, as, as things go on, you know, if if uh, I'm I'm going to try to update the donate page on my website and update the Patreon page as well to kind of really redefine some of the goals that I'm trying to hit. Uh, with the with the finances, what what your finances are going to, um, and, uh, and and you know just just what you're contributing to, uh, kind of update that so so you guys are aware and and there there's a little bit more transparency on my end here. Uh, so and, and of course the final bit here is you can always subscribe to become uh, join the email list. It's free. It goes out once a week. I send you a, uh, a list of all the videos and podcasts that I've released, and I'm sharing specifically my Rockfin channel because of all the uh, censorship that's happened on YouTube. Uh, so if you want, if you'd like that, you there you go. You can sign up for my free email list, krishmohanhaha.substack.com, weekly emails and monthly patron emails as well that gives you all your bonus stuff. Uh, and, uh, uh, I'm going to check your comments. I encourage you guys to leave comments the same way that you guys, uh, can see, you know, the, the little banners go up on the screen. That's how I'm going to put up the comments as well. Uh, for Rockfin, I'll probably end up reading the comments. Uh, I didn't go at me. Baby says, uh, anime is how I want uh, unwind. And they're on the final season of attack on Titan. Yeah, I, I, I do that as well. I do. I like to go back and kind of rewatch some of the older ones. Uh, I did a I did a dragon ball super kick and I was, uh, you know, that, that show is, is, uh, nostalgic, but it can be a very frustrating show to watch. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I am, uh, uh, I, I do enjoy, I do enjoy kicking into some, into some anime and I've, I've got a bunch of albums, uh, that I, that I want to sit and listen to 
without any sort of interruption, right? And and just kind of listen and rock out to the album. Uh, I think the the Foo Fighters put up a, put out a new album. Aesop Rock might have put out something new. Low key, there's a rapper named Low Key. He's putting out a new album soon. Um, so so there's some stuff that I want to check out. Some local bands and uh, local groups that have uh, put out some new albums that I need to 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 check out as well. So that's going to be my my Friday evening wind down is is uh, is what that's going to be. Uh, and again, I encourage you guys to leave comments on the on Facebook and Twitch and and Rockman as well. Uh, and and since we're talking about a big subject today, it's the, it's it's one continuous subject today. I will periodically stop and and take a look at comments and respond and stuff too. So with that, all that being said, bringing in my notebook here, trying not to bump the mic. Uh, let's dive into, let's dive into our, our big topic of conversation. So both these stories that, uh, you know, and, and one of them, one of them goes rather in depth into one of the issues, uh, uh, rather in depth for, for, for what the publication is It's from military times. And a buddy of mine, Jay Jackson sent me this article or, or pointed me in the direction of this article. The second is is an article that uh, uh, my friend Aiden put into the comments yesterday, and they kind of went hand in hand. So I wanted to talk about them, and this has been this has been a topic of debate, it, you know, for for quite some time. Um, and now, you know, it, it it's it's funny as to the the gravity that um, all of these organizations that have tolerated and almost encouraged. Uh, extremist behavior and racist behavior are now having to address it. So, so let's just get into it. Um, you know, Military Times has this article out about uh, extremism, far right extremism, and violence uh, within their ranks, and what the hell are they going to do about it, right? Uh, and the article starts talking about how they found a lot of people that had a military background that were either actively serving in the military or have active or, or, or veterans, right? They've, they have served in the military at some point. And, uh, and they found out that they have connections to some uh, far right extremist groups, right? Some, uh, and some of them are even evangelical extremist groups. Uh, and now the, the military is like, holy shit, this information is out. You know, that when, when they were uh, sending in the national guard into uh dc for the inauguration they were they had to you know boot somebody some of these folks out because they found out that they had ties to extremist right-wing groups now the issue here that i have is uh and, and we'll get into the surveillance aspect of it too the issue here is you know you guys have this huge uh, infrastructure of surveillance, right? Uh, it, it, you know, one of the things that they did in the military way back in the day was ask you whether you're a homosexual or not. And now that's not uh, legal and it shouldn't be, right? It shouldn't matter if, uh, whether you are gay or not. And you want to serve in the military. If you want to serve in the military, that's that's the the choice that you make. And, and your sexual orientation doesn't really have much to do with it. Uh, if the goal is to serve your country for whatever reason, right? So the don't ask, don't tell thing was, uh, but they did that for a while and they were asking the question. So to me, it's like, why wouldn't you ask the question or why wouldn't you just do criminal background checks to see where these people are? I mean, like low grade jobs are doing it. If you want to work at, you know, um, corporate car mechanic shop, number one, whatever the fuck it is, they do a background check. They probably check your social media. They probably check to see if you have criminal activity. And I know the military and most of these intelligence departments have the capability of doing that. So before you before you bring somebody else into the ranks, shouldn't you be able to do something like that? Shouldn't you be able to find out whether they are part of the KKK, part of some group like Vanguard or so on and so forth? But they kind of turn a blind eye to it, right? The article goes on to say that the, the Department of Defense, the DOD, really doesn't have a way to track any of this stuff. They don't have a way to track right wing extremism within the ranks. And, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, that might be true, because what if people lie? Right. What if people lie about it? That's a possibility. But again, the background checks would uh, would show you something. 
about who they are and what they believe in. And if the goal of the military uh, is to say that you are serving and protecting every single person in the United States, but you believe that, you know, black and brown people and LGBTQ people are lesser than the average white male in the country, how can you legitimately serve everybody in the nation when you think that a particular group is less than? It doesn't make sense, right? That That's a fallacy right there, and you have to address that. So to me, it kind of makes sense that if you have racist ideology, if you have xenophobic ideology, that the American military is probably not for you. Or so you would think. That's that's sort of what the logic would dictate. Um, you should be able to track these things. The extremist groups, the racist groups, they're the one that 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 talk about violence. And in a lot of cases, the Blue Leaks confirm this. If you remember the Blue Leaks, I did a show about the Blue Leaks a couple months ago. Uh, that's on pretty much all of my channels here. Is they basically pointed out that organizations like the FBI, law enforcement, and even even the Department of uh, Defense and the Home and Homeland Security know about right wing extremist violence. Know about and these are these are groups that are on social media. They're private groups on social media that have actively talked about committing violence towards police departments. In fact, one of the groups, the one of the uh, the violent factions of the Boogaloo Boys, uh, was led by a veteran, and he talked about specifically attacking a a a, a a, a sheriff's office and all of this was documented on social media through messenger and things like that and you know the fbi knew about it did nothing they did nothing about it so you know for them to come out and say there's no way of tracking it no there is a way of tracking it they're talking about it online they're talking about it within their their circles so there is a way for you to find out this information. How did you find out that all these National Guard members were part of these right-wing militia groups or extremist groups? It's just that the military has never needed a reason to look into these things. And even someone like Lloyd Austin, uh, who is the current Secretary of Defense in charge of the Pentagon here, has addressed uh, that he has seen uh, racism within his um, within you know in in his tenure of uh, within his tenure of of being in, in the military. I gotta find the right section here. Uh, I believe it's called why it's this time is different. Okay, so here. This talks about Lloyd Austin. Uh, Austin, an African-American who grew up in the deep south, graduated from West Point in 1975 and spent 41 years in the Army, brings personal perspective to the problem that could have a far-reaching impact. During his January confirmation hearing, Austin recalled his time as a lieutenant colonel in the 82nd Airborne Division. In 1995, racist paratroopers in the, milita in the unit murdered a black couple near Fort Bragg in North Carolina. A subsequent in investigation uncovered nearly two dozen skinheads in the division and sparked a global review of ex extremism in the Army's ranks. Uh, we woke up one day and discovered that we had extremist elements in our ranks, and they did bad things uh, that we certainly held them accountable for, Austin said. But we discovered that the signs for that activity were there all along. We just didn't know what to look for or what to pay attention to, but we learned from that. There were warning signs, Austin said, but leaders didn't see them. I can tell you that most of us were embarrassed that we didn't know what to look for, and we didn't really understand that being engaged with your people on these types of issues uh, can pay a big dividend. We can never take our hands off the wheel on this. This has no place in the military of the United States of America. So this guy basically is it, the, the big thing that they that he talks about here is that well we didn't know what we were looking for you didn't know what you were looking for how could you not know what you, you were looking for unless you don't know what racism looks like unless you don't know what what right wing extremist violence looks like right people calling for the extermination of a particular group of people that's what you're looking for 
You're looking for people that make uh, baselines, low-hanging fruit, stereotypical jokes, and don't mean it as a joke. They half mean it as a joke, but they really mean it as this is what we think of a group of people. What do you mean you didn't know what you were looking for? You knew what you were looking for when it came to homosexuals in the military. But you didn't know what you were looking for in regards to racists and extremists? Doesn't that just show that there's ignorance in this country about this issue? It's funny because you know you they they have to look they 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 can't ignore it anymore and that's what they've done. Look, this is 1995. What Lloyd Austin just just talked about in this article for Military Times is that in 1995 they found one division with a shit ton of skinheads that killed a black couple near a military base in North Carolina. They knew about it then. There should have been more app apparatus put in place to actually take care of this problem. To say, okay, we need to put a screening in place for this sort of stuff. How do we look at, you know, violent ideologies? And, and that is where... A lot of people go, right, because they have these tendencies. It's built up in them. The culture of America is is rooted in racism. And if you don't address the fact that the culture in America is rooted in racism, then it's going to bleed into, you know, what they do is is when it becomes unfashionable to hate black people, unfashionable to hate the LGBTQ community, unfashionable to hate brown people. They go and hide because they don't feel like it's it's safe for them to talk about it, but they need to do something with their rage. And then they go and join the police departments and then they go and join the, the military. In fact, they are encouraged to do so. Because the way they look at it is now I get to take care of the real problem in America and and, and create safety. I'm protecting the homeland and things of that sort. the mission statement of these organizations have to change. I mean, you know, the, the DOD and the Homeland Security, all of these intelligence agencies, they'll work with each other to, to some degree. But the FBI is rooted in racism. The CIA is rooted in xenophobia. The military being an imperialist force for American exceptionalism is rooted in both of those things. So you got to change the entire structure of what these uh, organization, what these entities actually fucking stand for in order to root that behavior out of the military. That's what it boils down to. Racism has always existed in America. From, from slavery onwards, we never really got rid of that kind of mentality. We never really got rid of the mentality that anybody that's not an Anglo-Saxon white Catholic male is dominant to everybody else. That mentality never fucking left the United States. That mentality is still here. These faux Christians that think that they're that think that they're better than everybody else, that mentality is still there. The evangelicals, all of that, it's just it's been ignored by all of these organizations for so long. Because religion and politics are, are faux pas and you don't talk to them. So you just ignore it. You skirt around it. You skirt around the discrimination. You skirt around the extremism that comes around from that. We've never addressed it. And now you're forced to. And now these organizations that have thrived on that, these organizations that have built up their memberships because of people that believe in these extremist ideologies to some degree are now like, well, fuck, that's not who we're trying to target i guess maybe or more realistically it's oh we got caught coddling these people and giving them an excuse for for their racism we turned a blind eye to it and let it grow and fester in the darkness and get bigger and bigger and now it's gone into the military, it's gone into the FBI, it's gone into the police departments on the on the lower ranking levels. I mean, the FBI has always been racist. I mean, J. Edgar Hoover was looking for a black messiah. That dude was racist beyond all reason. 
he thought an organization feeding kids was bad. Like that's that's what racism did. It rotted his brain to think that and that that a group of uh, black socialists feeding children was a terrorist organization. That's so bananas. So where do we go, right? If the military actually wants to acknowledge um, and get rid of this sort of extreme behavior, uh, discourage this sort of extremist behavior within within its rank, every level has to be swept. And this goes all the way up to the office of the president. This means that if Joe Biden really wants to take care of extremism, of racism, of discrimination, and address it within the ranks of the military itself, then he himself has to come out and acknowledge his role in the racist legislation that he's put forward, in all of the racist things that he has said in the past, and he has to make a legitimate apology and then act on that. Right? So you have to listen to what black activists have been saying for the last, I don't know, decade and a half at the minimum, you have to act on that. So when when these activists are out there and they're saying the only way that you can decrease racist in, institutional racist police violence is by defunding the police and refunding, uh, you know, social programs, mental health programs, education initiatives, then that's what you got to do. Because it's the logical fucking thing. You got to be real clear and definitive about what the police is used for. Got to be real clear and definitive about what the military is actually used for. You got to be real transparent about that shit. But they're not. I mean, he just bombed Syria over some false pretenses. You know, it has something to do with Iran. What? Iran fights ISIS. Isn't that the enemy in, in Syria? Isn't that who we're against? Is ISIS and, and, and Assad? That's what we're told about Syria, isn't that? But we're but we're trying to attack a, a, a country that is also fighting the same enemy. Isn't it the enemy of my enemy is my friend? Isn't that the old adage? That, what the fuck? Where is this coming? There's no transparency. And there's no acknowledgement from Joe Biden about his past. In fact, every time his record is brought up, he's shitty to reporters that bring it up. And then it becomes a rule within the DNC that you don't bring up Joe Biden's record. He absolutely needs to acknowledge what his role in uh, in, in in all of this is in leading to extremism in America that winds up in the military, that winds up in the police departments, that winds up in the intelligence agencies. These ideologies don't just birth themselves out of nowhere. They're manufactured. A lot of them are fucking manufactured. Like I mentioned, the Blue Leaks showed us that a lot of these extremist groups are anti-government and they're anti uh anti uh police and they're anti-military and they actively talk about committing violence. And the FBI and the cops and the ho and homeless they all knew about them. They all knew about them and they didn't do anything about them. The blue leaks showed us that. The other part of the problem is American exceptionalism in and of itself, right? American exceptionalism breeds xenophobia and breeds racism. When you are grow, uh, when when you when you are taught growing up uh, that America is the greatest country on the planet, no other country is better than America, and everything America does, uh, you know, is is covered in glitter and gold, that we're the land of milk and honey then you're you're essentially saying that anybody that doesn't consider themselves to be an American, anybody that doesn't look like the quintessential American, which for all intents and purposes is always taught to be a white Anglo-Saxon male. That's really what Americans believe themselves to be. Everybody else is a lesser degree to that. 
that's what you're taught through American exceptionalism. And American exceptionalism is what the American military is spreading around the world. Or so they say. And now what's happening within the Biden administration is that they're using a rainbow smokescreen to essentially sell that American exceptionalism and make excuses for their xenophobic behavior. Every war that we have faced always encourages racism, always encourages the xenophobic behavior. Think about it. After 9-11, what happened? How many people started attacking brown people because those were the enemies? There was no distinction between extremist terror groups that we were supposedly going after with the United States military and just an average brown person uh, that happened to be Muslim, that happened to be Hindu, that was Mexican. There was no distinction made by the military for that. They encouraged that sort of behavior. And when, when, when that sort of that sort of feeling grows and they go, yeah, this fucking, I hate this group of people, Rawr! you know, and then they go, well, I want to do something bigger and I want, I want this hatred to have purpose to join the military and the military doesn't screen them for it. The military doesn't ask them what they think of Muslims, what they think of Hindus and uh, f folks from uh, the, the Arabian Peninsula. They just go, great, come and, f come and fucking lay your life down. No big deal. All good here. All fucking good here. You know? Uh, I am going to check on a few comments here. Oh, there are quite a few on the... Uh, there are quite a few on the old rock fans. All right, give me a moment to try to, try to look through these. Uh, got a couple anime suggestions. Uh, here we go. White supremacists and militia types have always gone into the military for combat training. Nothing new. Too bad the DOD uh, uh, don't talk to <laughs> NSA. Shake my fucking head. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. You should uh, the, this or this. There should be some communication between the two, right? And and the other thing too is is the intelligence communities and local law enforcement know about some of the white supremacist groups that are out there, um, and they do nothing about it. They're doing nothing about it. That's part of the problem that 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 is leading to more of these, uh, you know, white supremacists joining the, the the militia. And and the next section I'm going to talk about is veterans. But if veterans are part of uh, this group, it they're going to encourage, you know, they or they might encourage people to join the military to learn combat training. Uh, and then after that, they're coming back and joining these uh, white supremacy groups. Uh, Aram, uh, is Chris banned from YouTube? I, I no, no, I'm I'm just pushing people more towards the rock fan because of all the censorship. I, I am I am on strike uh, from YouTube right now. Uh, I think that strike is going to last till the end of the week. So I think the Friday live stream will be the first live stream that I will be able to um, to stream on on YouTube again. Uh, that's over some bullshit reasons. Um, uh, Aram says white nationalists actively seek military infiltration and training uh, into police as well. Uh, oh, Sarah, thank you for clearing up the YouTube thing. Um, yes, yeah. So, so that's one of those things <clears throat> that. Um, oh man, lost my voice there for a sec. That's one of the major things is that they are encouraged to go in. They're the American exceptionalism. Uh, breeds that hatred, breeds that xenophobia, and then they take that xenophobia and they feel like they need a purpose for it, then the United States military pulls them in. The police forces pull them in, uh, and they get to commit their their violent hate crimes towards uh, black, brown, indigenous, LGBTQ community, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, maybe you question the guy with the SS or swastika or lightning bolt or 88 tattoos. Yeah. Um, agreed. I think that's, that's a good giveaway. <laughs> uh, DKOA, my baby also says the Air Force Academy is very evangelical, giving extra time off base to go to church, uh, or you stay in the barracks if you don't want to go to church. Um, yeah, um, that, that is, that is interesting. I don't, you know, I don't mind if you're someone religious and you're part of the military, as long as you don't use your religion as a reason to you know like 
if you're fighting a holy war within the military, like you're using the military as a vehicle to like commit religious hatred, uh, which is also like missing the point of what a fucking religion teaches you. Uh, so yeah. Uh, I'm going to come back to some of the YouTube suggestions that you guys have. Cause you guys have some good, good comments about the, but what's going on with YouTube. Uh, our imperialism fosters racism. Bombing brown and black people is pretty racist. Uh, and Nico House does that. I got the idea from him. Oh, oh okay. Oh, you're talking about the YouTube thing. Uh, uh, the other, the othering is necessary to get people uh, to kill, and it feeds into the racism. Yeah, exactly. But but this is the thing: is the military has encouraged that sort of stuff. The DoD, uh, the State Department. Uh, Homeland Security, all of these things have encouraged that level of xenophobia. We create this paranoia at home so to justify attacking uh, other countries overseas on false pretenses. And then what happens is they ignore all of the violence and hatred that has occurred on the home front based on their wars overseas, right? So if the enemy is black, brown, uh, people, it's it's Muslims, it's, it's this, that, and the third, then all of that is going to filter back here. And there's going to be people that feel like, well, there's already uh, this military presence overseas that's taking care of the terrorist threat across the ocean. We got to take care of it at home. And and these people don't know how to differentiate between an average practicing Muslim and someone that might believe in uh, in, in extremist uh, religious philosophies. They also don't know the difference between real Christianity and evangelical Christianity. And they probably lean towards the evangelical Christianity. And all of this stuff is encouraged. And part of it is because the, these, these, these military organizations uh, don't say dick all about that. There's no definition between what these people are actually facing. Uh, let me look at what you guys are saying about YouTube, too. Uh, you, I recommend using YouTube for exposure, and if they ban or remove comment, give them... Oh, I'd pop down. Give them an extra reason the next time. Just use them for all their work. Don't appeal. Don't grovel. Don't give them any extra thought. And when YouTube has enough, uh, has had enough, so let it be, uh, just create a two-minute video on YouTube telling people to go over to Rockfin. Yeah, it's a good idea. Once I once I do that, I might create a video specifically talking about Rockfin and getting people over to over to Rockfin. Uh, and you're saying Nico House does that. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Uh, in case it needs clearing up, Nico is not an imperialist. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I I read that comment um, uh, out of out of context. There, I'm not saying Nico House is an imperialist. <laughs> Uh, I got to make that clear. Nico House, not an imperialist. In, in fact, he would be considered an anti-imperialist. Uh, so, <laughs> but thank you for all the suggestion uh, on on fighting some of the YouTube censorship and and getting people over to uh, to Rockfin. That the, the, there there's some good ideas there. So I appreciate that. Uh, so let's go to the next section uh, about uh, you know in um, in our stream here, which is. Uh, why we see a lot of veterans in these extremist groups, right? Because that's something that the that the Military Times article also talks about. Um, and and again, they're like, "Oh man, where did all this racism even come from?" And it's like, you guys, you guys created the fucking problem, and now the chickens have come home to roost. Uh, because again, the military, even though it's it's the socialist secret of America, if you if you uh, if you focus on careerism in the military, the government will just take care of you, right? There there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the military is America's socialist secret. Uh, you know they they're like shocked that this sort of stuff is happening. This sort of stuff is happening, and with veterans, what happens is, let's say you don't choose careerism. Let's say you don't want to continue advancing and, and and making your career the military, right? Uh, what happens? You come home, you get discharged, uh, right. you get an honorable discharge, and then you have to deal with what? PTSD, physical pain, uh, mental health issues. Uh, the VA gets backed up. The VA sometimes doesn't provide uh, very good um, very good services uh, and things of that sort. Uh, 
and even then there's racism within within uh the, the the veteran population as well because because that level of xenophobia still exists within the veteran population um i remember one of my very very early road gigs this is maybe 20 oh boy when the fuck was this i want to say 2013 2014 uh, likely 2014 you know we're we're looking at the early years of uh of Chris on the road i didn't even have a beard at that point if you can imagine it which i do got i got to i got to get a new charger for my electric razor and kind of look at this thing it's gotten kind of it's gotten it's it's starting to get a little out of hand anyway but i was in fort wayne indiana it was my first time in fort wayne dead of winter there's maybe 20 people at this at this little bar right and i'm doing about 30 to 40 minutes of comedy there and i start talking about um i'm not even doing anti-war material at this time right i was still a younger comic i was still kind of figuring out how to talk about these bigger socio-political topics uh and utilize them for comedy and utilize them for a, a source of conversation and such right um so there's this guy clearly a little intoxicated but his friends were there kind of kind of watching him right and uh he had uh, uh he he had camo pants on right he had camo pants on he had a big baggy jacket uh and and he was wearing a hat and i couldn't see what the hat said the hat said usmc marine, marine corps that's uh, uh, you know that's that's what he was a part of. i didn't see what the hat said because he was kind of sitting off to the side and i'm doing my bit and i'm and I, and i and i do a joke about religion right uh, i used to have a joke about uh, religions trading certain things and uh it, it was a very early joke of mine um you know satirizing certain aspects of religion and i get to that bit and i and i talk about islam for you know hot second literally like a hot second it's one line and then you know we, we hit the punchline, and and you know people laughed and he kind of started spouting some stuff and i and I, and I didn't want to make fun of him because I could tell that he was drunk and a little disgruntled and his friends were just trying to cool him down. So I kind of was just like, hey, man, what's going on? What's the issue here? And he starts going off about uh, Muslims and Pakistanis and this, that and the third. And I was like, I don't understand what you're saying. Like, I'm not trying to justify the tenets of Islam or the pillars of Islam or any. I'm not even trying to have a religious debate here. It was just sort of a joke pointing out some of the absurdities within religion. And then I find out that uh, the problem this gentleman has is that he finally got veteran services. He, he finally got his, his services in the VA, um, and, uh, and the doctors are from Pakistan, and they're Muslims. The problem is they don't speak very good English. OK, and, and this was tough for me to decipher because there was a lot of like racist shit that he was throwing out there. And I was trying to deflect it and kind of just decipher what the fuck he was saying. And eventually we figured it out His friends, you know, were, were helping me out a little bit. I found out that the, the VA doctor, there's a language barrier, right? There's a language barrier, which means that the bedside manner, not that great. When when you have major language barriers, it's going to create some difficult bedside manner. And this veteran just basically saw that this was a Pakistani doctor that had come to the United States that was treating veterans, right? And and I don't I I don't know what the character of this of this doctor particularly was, but if you're a doctor that comes from a different country to the United States and works with veterans at the VA hospital, I don't think you're doing it for the money. You know what I mean? Like this guy doesn't seem like he's doing it for the money. Um, so I, I kind of was trying to be like, Hey man, there's a language barrier. There's, I know there's bedside manner, you know, maybe try to connect with them. I don't know. I, I I'm sorry. You're having a rough time at the VA, but I'm glad you got services. Right. But I thought about that later. And I thought about this thing of like, well, you know, what war did he serve in? And, uh, I found out from his friends, he served in, he, he served in Vietnam and then also like the early daddy Bush Gulf war. Um, is what he served in. And I was like, well, of course, you wouldn't trust a Vietnamese doctor either when you've been programmed to think that those people are your enemies. People that look like that are your enemies. So now you're at the VA, you've been taught your entire life that that somebody that's brown, that doesn't speak English, that believes in, in, in Islam and considers themselves to be a devout Muslim is the enemy. 
there's no distinction for this guy between uh, uh you know a doctor from Pakistan and an enemy insurgent that they have to kill. The only difference is he can't kill that doctor under the authorization of the United States military. And that's what that program breeds. Now, the other part of it is, you know, there are veterans that go in that direction. I obviously have met a few of them. Um, the other part of it is you go in, in two other directions is where you can go, right? You can become this passive racist a uh, person that you know can't just dis- the, the the racism is more ignorant than it is um, extreme to the point of uh, I want to kill this group of people. Yeah. Um, the reason why the veterans feel this way, the reason why veterans veer towards that anti-government route, is you know they sacrificed their life for this country. Uh, a lot of them come back with injuries, missing limbs, uh, a bevy of mental health issues that aren't particularly taken care of. We just talked about how difficult the VAs can be. I had a friend that it took him a decade to get VA services. You know, and I, I, I had another friend who got VA services, but they were not great. So. And, and, and look, I've, I've also had friends from the military that have had very positive experiences with the VA, where if it wasn't for the VA, they wouldn't have survived. They might have taken their own life. They might have uh, committed crimes. They might have, uh, you know, gone into prison and, and a bevy of other things, alcoholism, drugs, all this other stuff. So, you know, there's different. But uh, but from what I've heard, the VA, there is a lot of issues with the VA, which, in my opinion, if you're going to go serve in rich people's wars, then rich people need to fucking take care of the people that serve in their fucking wars. Because guess what? Eventually, it, it'll wind down to you having to serve in your own fucking wars. They come home and they have to fend for themselves. They're told that they're doing this honorable thing. This, this is the greatest thing that you can do for your country is to protect the freedoms, protect democracy, right? And then when they're done, they're tossed aside. They're thrown to the side of the curb. 17% of veterans end up being homeless, which is 17% too fucking many. So what happens? They start realizing that the government that sent them into war, not great. They were lied to. They were betrayed. So where do you go from that? Where do you go when all of the things that you believed in come crumbling down in an instant? Look, um, I arrived to the point of view and and my life philosophy uh, gradually from my late teens into my 20s. And I continue to grow and evolve, right? Excuse me. I didn't have a like snap moment where everything just changed. Yeah. I lived through 9-11. I faced the racism of that. I understood what that was. And I was hoping that, you know, uh, under Obama, some of the immigration laws would change. It didn't. Um, it, it, it was harder to get uh, my green card for my family under under Obama. We went through a lot of a lot of trouble and strife under the Obama administration deported more immigrants, you know, so I started to see, okay, maybe the Democratic Party isn't all that great. So gradually, 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 by the time I turned like 23, 24, I had started to believe in these anti-establishment ideas. I was starting to become more anti-war. I was starting to become more anti-establishment. I was coming into my own. I was becoming more and more of a socialist, discovering new people, discovering new ideologies, you know, reading more Chomsky, finding Dr. Richard Wolff. That all started happening gradually. If that had happened in a flash, I don't know how I would have reacted. Probably very poorly. I would have probably made decisions uh, that would have negatively affected me, my family, and for all intents and purposes, uh, my ethnicity. (laughs) 
right? Because if if I did do something crazy and extreme, because I had this snap moment where all of the things I believed crumbled down, and I didn't have that incremental way of coming out to realize what I needed to realize, to arrive onto this side of the fence, to arrive to see the clarity and the truth of the way the system works. If all of that was just bam, flashed onto me, I would have probably made some pretty extreme decisions in my life. Psychologically, that's a lot to deal with in a short period of time. So these people see it as a flash, though. It's not an incremental thing. And if that is, you know, some people might be able to cope with it. They might not act out of that extremism. They might take the time to reflect. And if they take the time to reflect, it's likely that they'll lean left, anti-war, more towards the socialist stuff. Even if it's like, okay, social democracy is the, you know, they'll, they'll kind of lean that way and become anti-establishment and anti-government. But what they focus on is direct action, education, civil disobedience, amplification, that sort of stuff. They champion anti-war movements. In fact, a lot of those veterans end up being the forefront of the anti-war movement themselves. But then you have the other direction that you go to. You choose that extreme behavior. And they end up uh, in the more extreme and violent wings of uh, organizations like the Boogaloo Boys, right? And there was that big controversy with Jimmy Dore that I don't feel like was really a controversy. To me, when I listened to that gentleman uh, you know, had you not told me he was a Boogaloo boy, I probably wouldn't have made the connection. I would have thought, well, this guy seems like a, uh, a an, 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 an anarchist, uh, you know, a socially left anarchist, uh, probably some shit I disagree with him on, but he seems like he's rational enough to have a conversation with those disagreements. Uh, but there is a violent faction of the Boogaloo boys. And uh, they are uh, usually led by uh, disgruntled veterans. There was again that story of the of the the, the Navy veteran that decided that he was going to go and attack the uh, the sheriff's office. He was talking about committing violence towards cops in a private Facebook group. The FBI knew about it, and they didn't do anything to stop the violence. And the veterans choose that because they're disillusioned. They're betrayed by their own country. And when you have that flash pan moment. You can either choose to take a step back and reflect, or you choose to act on that extreme realization. Which anytime you act on extreme emotion, it's very likely that the decision that you make is going to be kind of harmful. The reality is that the military has created its own problems, and now that the chickens have come home to roost, they don't know how to fucking deal with it. And they're dumbfounded because they ignored the problem for so long. They created the problem for so They benefited from these from creating these problems. They manufactured these issues, benefited from it, and now it's gotten too big that they can't really control it. It's it's outside their purview, and they go, well, uh, I, uh, oh, shit, fuck, uh, 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 you know, and then they, and now they have to address it. They don't want to address it. They have to now. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, a dingo ate me, baby. They also want a sense of belonging, so they joined those groups. Very, yeah, and and Sarah confirms that is is very true. Exactly. The military had offered them that sense of purpose, right? In in certain cases, religion can offer that sense of purpose. You know, uh, joining a particular social group can offer that sense of purpose. You feel like you belong. You're part of something bigger. You know, that's what people that's what people kind of need. They they feel, they need to feel like they mattered. That's the reality of it. They just need to feel like they fucking matter. And in the military, they felt like they mattered. They came home. The military stopped giving a shit about them and they don't matter anymore. Now, that is the point where I think. You know, if you have a veteran friend and they're having a tough time, maybe introduce them to to uh, uh, a Noam Chomsky. 
you know, maybe introduce them to some anti-imperialist topic point uh, topics. Tell them about some things with Karl Marx. Have a conversation with them about how they feel, you know. And instead of them joining these right wing militia groups, these extremist violent groups, they come on the side and they start reading hedges. Well, maybe they should wait on reading hedges until they are in a, uh, a more positive headspace. Uh, not that I dislike hedges. I do like hedges. But if I'm in a particularly bad headspace and I read hedges, I'm just like, yeah, nothing matters. The universe is full of lies. <laughs> you know, he's not he, he's not the hopeful read. And I keep telling people that you know, it is is like be it be in a, an objective headspace when you read <laughs> when you start reading hedges. <laughs> um, but introduce them to these ideas. Let them know that they're not alone. That's the important part. They're not alone. Honestly, some of these live streams that I do to, to, to see the comments that I see, the encouragement and the positive responses, uh, you know, like you guys chat with each other in, 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 the, in the chat area there. It, it all that makes me feel like, OK, I'm not alone. I belong to this really awesome community. And we're all kind of fighting for the betterment of, of the world itself, you know? If I didn't have that, I might be in a lot more of a depressed place. I might be in a darker place. I might not be as motivated as I am. You know, I have my nerdy friends that I can talk to comic books about. I have my friends that I can listen to music and talk to them. It's a sense of belonging. You, you come together as a community. And in, in America, the problem is there is no sense of community that is encouraged when you grow up. My sister and I were having this conversation about like not knowing our neighbors because when we were in India, we fucking knew our neighbors. Uh, I, I I would go and hang out at my neighbor's house for hours because they had Cartoon Network, right? So my mom would make me um, my mom would make me a little bit of a lunch, and then I would go over there and I would eat my lunch with my neighbor and watch cartoons with my neighbor. Right. And my neighbors were, were, were kind of older at the time. They were uh, about my grandparents age. They were basically like my second grandparents. I knew my neighbors here. Th this is I will I will legitimately say where I live now in Millvale, Pennsylvania, where I live now. This is the first community where I've actually had conversations with my neighbors. Like when we hang out on the front porch, you know, over the summertime, if we're just sitting on the front porch having a drink or something uh, and we look across the street and our neighbors are out, we have a conversation with our neighbors. This is the first fucking neighborhood that I've lived in America where that's happened. Everywhere else, you mind your own damn business. You keep yourself within the confines of your own white picket fence, and that's it. So how is that building a sense of community? And again, that hyper-individualism that is preached, that is thought, uh, that is taught to us through American exceptionalism, has now bit the fucking country in the ass. And look, again, I'm 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 a, I'm an introvert, right? I, I get my recharge by being alone and doing the things that I want to, thinking, you know, having that time to reflect on my own. I'm not saying I need that a hundred percent of the time, but I mean, when I lived in India, if one of our neighbors wasn't doing well, we all knew, and we rallied together as a building, and we're like, hey, how do we help? When I got in trouble, everybody in the building knew and they would come to my mom and be like, hey, what's up? Like, does he need, you know, like, do you need me to watch him from time to time so you can have a little bit of, 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 a, of a break? Like, what's going on? That that sort of shit is very rare here. But what I will say is I think people are looking for that. And there's a positive way of encouraging community and there's a negative way of encouraging community. And the opportunity, the opportunistic ones, these extremist groups that preach violence, they pull you in when you feel like you don't have a sense of community. Again, it's one of those things where it's like, Socialism not that bad sometimes, guys. Jay, good to see you. Uh, and thank you for sending me the story, by the way. I really appreciate that. Uh, and I encourage other people to do the same. 
Uh, Jay says a large part of what makes the treatment of veterans so odious is because uh, we are constantly called heroes and thanked for our service, and it ends up making those uh, promises feel especially empty. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Jay, this has been this has been expressed to me by virtually every veteran I meet on the road. I was in Louisville, Kentucky, and this guy, um, you know, his his girlfriend was super sweet and and would like raise her hand and ask questions in the middle of the show. And at that point, I'm not even mad, right? I'm just like, this is kind of great. Uh, as, as, like somebody that hasn't heard these perspectives is still like yearning for more. I love it. Uh, and he came and talked to me. He bought me a drink and we sat down and he was like, look, I'm a conservative. I'm, I'm, I'm a right winger. Uh, I have voted Republican my entire life, except for Trump, right? That, that's where I, uh, I said, no, thank you. Uh, and he voted libertarian. So he was a he was a a, a military man, you know, uh, was looking to be a career military guy, got out uh, and he was like, look, I agree with pr pretty much everything you're talking about. Probably where we deviate is um, is some of the 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 executions of of how we get to the, the solution. Right. A, 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 but the solution is we agree on what the solution is. And he said the same thing. He was like, the thing that pisses me off the most is looking at people in the VA, looking at some of my friends that need medical services. They keep claiming we're heroes. They keep claiming we're so fucking important. And, and then don't do anything about it. You know, they don't provide us with services. Uh, I, I found out that it's less than 1% of the, uh, of the war budget that actually winds up, um, winds up going to, to the VA. Less than 1%. I think it's like 0.7% is what they calculated back in 2016. I don't see that number going any higher. The only, tr the only like, uh, in media, uh, Jay, you and I are nerds, uh, you know, in media the, where I've seen a positive view of veterans is Captain America Winter Soldier, right? The scene where even Cap shows up and uh, Sam Wilson, spoilers, uh, but that movie is uh, very old, so uh, I feel like I don't need to put a spoiler warning. But Sam Wilson is running a a a meeting, you know, uh, kind of like a kind of like a, a a a style meeting. Everybody's in a circle, sharing stories. Uh, the Punisher does the same thing, where where the where it's like these other veterans that have gone through uh, this turmoil and come out of it okay are the ones that are helping other veterans. And it's not, and again, so that's the positive community, right? But should it, be, you know, we, we have this conversation and my view is, should it be only veterans that come up with this, right? Are veterans the only people that are allowed to take care of veterans? Why isn't the government putting more into, into the VA? Why isn't the government putting more into programs that can help veterans, help them get mental health services, help them get physical health services, do all the trauma, it makes you feel empty. And then when you feel that empty and you don't have a pot, you know, if you don't know that there is another veteran running a, a, a group where you guys get together, you know, drink some coffee, have some donuts, share your stories, share your experiences, share how you feel and work on things together. Then they lead to these, these negative communities. Good. That's a good point, Jay. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Jim Engel says you would love it in Germantown, uh, Germantown, Maryland. I, you know, I've driven through German. I lived in DC for a little while. I, I, I um, uh, I drew, drove through Germantown, uh, a few times. Uh, and I gotta say it's, it, it always looked like a very nice, nice little community to me. I, I, uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed driving through it. Uh, Jim says, I'm interested in shaking the test tube and hoping all the molecules stack in useful configuration. <laughs> Uh, questions I've had for centuries. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to move to the last part of our, our discussion here. This is, uh, this is an article that was sent to me by, uh, by, uh, a friend of the show, uh, Aiden. Uh, he sent it to me yesterday, actually. Let me pull up the, uh, there it is. Cause I want to share a little audio of this cat. So, this is about uh, a gentleman by the name of Fritz uh, Berggren. He's a PhD. So I'll just I'll just kind of read uh, a portion of this article here uh, from uh, Patheos, a, a friendly atheist. Uh, I think the website's pronounced Patheos. I apologize if it's 
I'm, I'm, I'm not pronouncing it properly, but this is by Hamath Mehta. I've, I've read a, a, a variety of articles with him, and, and he's, he, he's, he's a pretty good writer. Uh, every, again, every so often we have a disagreement, and um, you know, I, I, I see where he's coming. Like he does a good job of uh, like I see where you're coming from, kind of thing. So here's uh, this is an argument. Fritz, Fritz Berggren, uh, PhD, is one of those insane Christians who blog whose blog posts usually come to light only after he's done something truly awful and everyone asks how this went undetected for so long we covered how we, we don't really talk about this sort of stuff it's taboo to talk about religion and politics right so the big questions don't really get answered they don't really get discussed because that sort of stuff isn't encouraged uh in in the um uh in the american zeitgeist as it were uh, for example, he said last October that Jesus Christ came to save the world from the Jews, uh, the founders of the original Antichrist religion. They are the seed of the serpent, the brood of vipers. He added, Jewish ideas poison people. This is banana sandwiches, right? This is this is like the level, this is the true level of hatred that you get to see that uh, that shocks people. But this is this is where it's always been. First of all, he's wrong. Jesus, you know, was a Jew. That's just a fact. So, how would he have come to save the world from the Jews? What to to me, I look at what what Jesus was talking about as sort of the evolution of the religion. Yeah, this is where we were, guys. And this is sort of the tradition of what we believed in. But the world is changing around us. And the religion might need to change, too. So here are some things that we can think about to change our philosophies, to change the way of our life so that it moves forward with the world. But that's not what this dude is talking about. <laughs> this dude is coming at it from, uh, you know, we're better because we believe in this guy who is part of this tribe, but he hates the tribe. None of that fucking makes any sense. Uh, he says it gets worse. Here we go. Uh, so th he, he, uh, this is another quote from Fritz here. The goal of the left is to destroy blood and faith so that Marxist religion alone becomes the master and enslaver of all. Europeans must reclaim their blood and faith just as blacks are proud and Hispanics have a very strong blood identity organizations. Th like, this is crazy bonkers shit to me. Like, I know this exists, but this is almost like, uh, you know, blood sacrifice type shit. It, like, I, I can definitely picture this dude being like, we sacrificed this virgin this day. And Jesus is like, no, that's not. I fucking, I said, don't do that shit anymore. Just be cool to each other. It. Did you guys miss, what book are you guys reading? What book did who did somebody write a parody book that people are taking seriously? Like that's kind of what this this sounds this really sounds like it's over the top parody of like evangelicals, right? Like over the top parodies of televangelists. But this dude is for real. Like this dude is a legitimate person. And here here's here's the part that gets a crazy that gets crazy. Yikes, a Christian nationalist and white supremacist to the core, full of all the racism and anti-Semitism you would expect. Maybe the scariest excerpt of all is this one calling for the creation of theocracies because the revival of Christian nation states is required for the advancements of truth. He also says there is no substitute for the public acclamation of Jesus Christ as the king and the Lord uh, of a nation. Again, th like these people are also like um big uh pro-democracy people but they're essentially calling for a theocratic dictatorship uh under under jesus who not here just i just want to point that out uh it, it if he is here he's kind of laying low uh because because of shit like this he's like man i don't want to be associated with this crazy stuff i'm just gonna hang out here and you know, fucking Biloxi. I don't picture Jesus going to like the tech places. Like, I think he would want to be in like a cool kind of blue collar rust, like amongst true people, like salt of the earth people and just be like, Hey, maybe don't hate black people for a little while. And they're like, ah, fuck. 
makes a good point. I don't know who that guy is, but I like listening to him. You know, <laughs> like that vaguely brown person with the beard. He seems real chill. Maybe we should <laughs> we we should listen to this guy. You know, uh, why is all this relevant now? Because it turns out Bergren works as a foreign service officer in the United States, uh, United States State Department. Well, well OK, uh, I kind of put my own foot in my mouth on that one. The U.S. State Department. That would be the better way of saying that instead of saying state twice. Uh, it's like saying ATM machine. Uh, Politico's Nahal Tusi explains, according to a... Direct reviewed by Politico, Bergeron is currently assigned to a State Department unit that handles special immigrant visas for Afghans. His previous positions have included serving as a financial management officer at the U.S. Embassy in Bahrain, according to an older directory. Asked about Bergeron, a, a spokesperson for the State Department declined to state whether his remarks has led to inter internal disciplinary measures of any kind. We will not comment on internal uh, personnel matters beyond saying that they are personal views and do not represent those of the State Department. Very standard kind of corporate PR answer, right? Uh, as a department, we embrace and champion diversity, equality, and inclusion as a source of strength. So here we go. This is this is the thing that I did want to kind of show you guys. It's going to be a two-minute clip, right? So they claim diversity and all this stuff. And again, it makes me question, how can you champion diversity? If your personnel in charge of special immigrant visas for Afghans is a racist, is somebody that believes that people from Afghanistan are lesser than. If you believe in uh, the Islamic faith, then you are wrong and therefore a terrorist and need to be exterminated. If you believe in those things, how can you objectively do your job? You can't. You really just can't. Eventually, that's going to seep out. That's just the fact of the matter. And we see it all the time. Eventually, these people are maybe going to try to run a coup of the government. They might, they might storm the Capitol. That's where that goes when it remains unchecked. People get fired from their jobs for tardiness, right? Um, not filing things the right way. But they don't get fired for having fucking hatred, hate-filled hate views. It doesn't make any sense. So this is this is uh, something that he this, this, I think this came out right after um, or, or or close to the election, close to November 3rd. And this is some shit he has to say about when, uh, you know, what happens if Biden wins, which everybody did. Everybody and their mother kind of did, including myself, did a video of like what to expect when Biden wins kind of thing. So here we go. Uh, this is a two minute clip. Let me know if you can hear it. If you can't leave a comment. And we saw that most clearly four years ago when Bernie Sanders, who should have been the Democrat nominee, was in fact uh, not elected uh, by the average Democrat voter, but in fact was was chosen as a result of the superdelegates. He's talking about superdelegates. So you've got a subversion of the idea that the Democrat Party actually represents real people and real voters out there. And that was seen most clearly in, in uh, 2016 when Bernie Sanders lost to Hillary Clinton for the Democrat nomination simply because of the, uh, the squeeze put on the superdelegates. Fast forward to today, and, and uh, uh, you know, five days from now, a new president will be chosen, theoretically. Uh, obviously, you guys have your own opinions about what's going on in the streets right now, Antifa, BLM, the riots, and uh, that, that's, that's not what this show is about. Uh, let's say that uh, Biden gets elected. What will happen? You all understand that Biden's lost his mind. He, he, he's mentally, he's gone. He doesn't remember if it's Thursday or Tuesday or Friday or if the current president is Donald Trump or George Bush. Uh, he doesn't know. What's he, the he, difference? He's not there. And he has a hard time forming coherent thoughts. And, I, you know, I'm not making fun of the guy. It's just the way it is. Now, imagine this. The Democrat 
convention, the virtual convention, uh, they get together and they decide, uh, theoretically, Biden chooses his running mate, right? <laughs> so the party leaders get together and uh, who, who are they going to have be Biden's running mate? Uh, is it Booty Gig, the, the little gay guy from the Midwest? Is it uh, the Irish guy who thinks he's Mexican? What's his name? Uh, Roberto Beto. And, you know, then you've got, you've got, uh, you know, the, the black gal, the big fat black gal from Atlanta. I forget her name. Uh, you've got the, the, the Jamaican Abrams. Indian, uh, Kamala Harris. You got some real kind of freaky folks. You got some real freaky folks. This is what he thinks of. Uh, look, and I don't like any of these fucking people. I'm not a fan of them, but I'm not a I'm not a fan of them for their policies and their records, not because of their identity. Right. Uh, freaky people. So, again, uh, people are just a little gay guy from Midwest. That's what he's that's what he calls him. So anybody that's part of the LGBTQ community, freaky. If you are uh, if, if you are a, a, a black person from Atlanta, freaky. Uh, if you are, <laughs> if you are half black and half Indian, freaky to this guy. Oh, how can this even happen? What mythical creatures are these? Uh, I will say the Beto O'Rourke thing. That is something that uh, I, even lefties have given him a lot of shit about, and, and that is something that came out. Is his name is Robert O'Rourke? He chose the name Beto because he was going to run for uh, run for office in Texas, which has a large Latino population, and he should pick a name that uh, that appeals to the Latin community. Uh, that's legitimately why he picked Beto O'Rourke. That was that was the doing of uh, of his of his family and such, right? Um, so again, why would the State Department put this guy in charge of special immigrant visas when he has a record of hating people? He has a record of thinking that the other is freaky folks, you know? So it, th this is a problem that's been bred in the system itself. You do a background check for virtually virtually anything and everything, but you can't do a background check for uh, whether a person can objectively do their job properly. If you ask this guy in an interview, hey, Fritz, we found this video uh, where you call, uh, you know, Pete Buttigieg, Stacey Abrams, and Kamala Harris freaky folks because of their identity. Do you feel like uh, this statement, which is racist, uh, is going to prevent you from doing your job objectively? That's a very good interview question, isn't it? <laughs> and he would give you a, a, an answer to that. And my guess is that he would not be able to hide that uh, that racism beyond a sentence or two. Who you are eventually comes out. I'm sure asking that question itself would prompt a lot of anger from him. So um, right now, so the political article that they mentioned up at the top uh, doesn't really talk about his Christian violence. He talks about Christian violence as well. Uh, none of this means Bergeron will be fired. He has First Amendment right to say these things. The question is whether his views have impacted his work or he composed these posts while on the clock or with government computers. Whatever the case, it all makes Mike Pompeo's open Christian nationalism, uh, nationalism look downright quaint. <laughs> So here we are. We have a dude in the State Department that is very clearly racist, and and it should be, very much come to the question of, um, can he objectively do his job? My guess is no. His core beliefs will not allow him to make that objective job when this is what he truly believes in. And again, this goes down to his first amendment rights. And that's one of the things they bring up. Um, even in the military times article, they bring up like, okay, this is first amendment rights here. They're allowed to express their thoughts, their opinions and their feelings. Um, but when it comes down to, uh, can they be objective of following the mission? But if we're going to say that the military's mission breeds this sort of racism, it fans the flames of it and makes that more intense. Then it does sound like the military is going to have to, uh, be clear about what they're looking for, what they'll tolerate, and how they operate as an organization. 
Now, the First Amendment is protected. It is protected. But it's only protected to the point um, <clears throat> where where they're calling for violence, which uh, uh, Fritz Berg Berggren here has called for violence. He has celebrated Christian violence. And that's where I think it comes to a close. Right? That's it. If you're going to celebrate violence, you don't get to keep your job. You don't have First Amendment protections. That's it. It's over and done with. This guy should be fired for that. But he's not. The state Again, so then the State Department is essentially protecting people like this and putting them in a position of power to make decisions of people's lives. So if there are Afghan refugees that want to come into the United States and gain some protected status through a special visa, and he decides that they're not uh, that they're that they're not gonna that he's not gonna fucking do that. Then that's not him objectively doing his job. The United States military has created the problem where there are families that need to be protected within the United States because of the attacks from the United States. They're creating a refugee crisis, and this guy, being the racist that he is, is in charge of seeing if those refugees can get protected or not. My view is this. Look, this opens up the opportunity for, you know, now they're now they're kind of kind of use this as Patriot Act version two, and they have been, right? So anything that isn't uh friendly to the Democratic Party, they're taking down. We we've seen that uh with how many how many lefty channels getting demonetized on YouTube. My videos are getting deleted, Consortium News is getting deleted, Randy Credico is getting de deleted. They're getting these random ass fucking strikes with nothing. define what you're looking for if you want this program to succeed right if you want this to succeed um you have to very clearly define what extremism is and what racism is and why you're not going to tolerate it and how it can cloud your judgment within the military and how you're going to screen for it the tough part is that how how are you going to screen for it how are you going to figure it out through that definition and I don't think they have that path right now. Um, and, you know, to be quite honest, I'm not sure what that path is. But if the military is going to say, we're, we want to we want to take care of. Um, we want to get rid of the extremism within our within our ranks, we want to get rid of extremism for our veterans. You're going to have to identify what it is and come up with a clear cut solution. Uh, that that works off of that clear definition. You can't use this as a scapegoat to uh, open up spying on on uh, on uh, unwarranted spying on the American populace. You can't use that as a way to squash the anti-war movements because then it's just gonna look bad. <laughs> like you don't give a shit about the extremism that's actually out there. Uh, Jay says uh, Beto O'Rourke's name was given to him uh, by family as a baby. His parents are El Paso natives. It has nothing to do with his political career. Uh, I've read that that's uh, just a story that they gave to the press. Um, that So his dad is um, pretty rich. I think he's a rich guy that's donated a lot to the Democratic Party. This is what I, this is what I read in 2019. Uh, and uh, he basically was grooming Robert O'Rourke to be... Uh, to have a career in politics and basically said, if you want the Latin vote, you need to sound more Latin. And that's why uh, in that first debate, he like did that whole Spanglish thing, which was weird and unnecessary. And a lot of Latin people from Texas were like, just stop. Just don't do that. That's very obnoxious. Um, so I, I have heard that um, originally. And then I, I read an article that debunked that. Uh, and, and they were pitching him as that too. When, when he was running against Ted Cruz, uh, he, they were pitching him as this like cool hip, like I got this awesome nickname kind of person. Um, and they were trying to get more of the youth vote, which worked successfully. But then once you kind of found out that he had like billionaire ties and, uh, you know, he, he doesn't have, uh, like real blue collar roots. It, it, it just kind of killed his credibility a lot. 
um you know and i guess now he went around texas uh during this thing and and met with some people uh i i don't know i don't really know what he's doing now uh but yeah that's that's the story that i've read um is that uh that the whole it was given to him as a nickname as a baby was uh was false it was just something given to the press to kind of spin and and build his image uh for his political career uh over on rockfin uh I <laughs> didn't 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 know that about Beto. Yeah, Abby Martin is the one that broke that story. Um and uh Abby Martin fantastic anti-war journalism. Uh she talks a lot about uh, American imperialism and the American empire. So if you want if you want somebody that really covers what's going on in terms of foreign policy, coups, economic censorship, economic sanctions and things of that sort, Abby Martin and the Empire Files. That's the way to go. Big thumbs up for 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 that. Uh she's fantastic. Um but we are going to wind things down here. Uh, I'm going to do my little wrap up thing, put up the little banners of and and all the all the little promo shtick that I got to do. Uh, but uh, I'm I always leave a little bit of time for a little Q and A at the very end. So if you have any questions, comments, uh, concerns, anything that you want to drop in the chats, feel free to drop that in the chats. And after I do my little spiel, I will I will come back. We'll answer that, and then we'll we'll say goodbye. And and uh, I will try to wrap this up before Ron Placone starts his live stream here. Uh, so. Uh, as per usual, if you enjoyed our topic of conversation, uh, please do hit that like button. Please do hit that share button. Get the word out that we are talking about these topics that you are not going to hear in corporate mainstream media. Uh, as you guys know, I am heavily censored on YouTube and Facebook, uh, so I very much depend on people sharing this content out to uh, to get the word out there. And uh, make sure that you're subscribed. Make sure that you hit that bell to make sure that you're getting notifications that I am going live because sometimes they uh, they don't notify you that I'm doing that. Uh, last but not least, uh, well, not last but not least, second, uh, if you want to financially contribute to the show, and I know some of you guys that are watching do regularly financially contribute to the show, and I very much appreciate that. Every little contribution helps. Uh, you can go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. Uh, you can make a one-time contribution, which basically acts as super chats, uh, or you can become a sustaining member. Sustaining members uh, make monthly contributions and you get uh, a, an email every single month that has uh, free tickets to the virtual shows. The next one is March 26th. Uh, you get uh, bonus stand-up comedy and storytelling tracks. You get early access to some of the longer episodes of Forkful of Noodles and some other fun bonus gifts every once in a while. So, uh, And you can become a sustaining member via Patreon, directly on my website, PayPal, uh, Bandcamp has a way that you can become a monthly contributor. Uh, so there's various different ways to do that. Uh, and if you're on Rockfin, over on rockfin.com slash krishmohanhaha, uh, if, if you're on stable financial ground, you can leave a tip for the channel or become a subscriber as well, which gives you access to uh, the premium content of every single content creator on Rockfin, which is very exciting. And last but not least, last but not least, uh, you can join my free email list that goes out once a week. Uh, so if you missed a portion of this live stream or, or, or you missed yesterday's live stream or can't make it to one of these, uh, I put up every single video and podcast that I've released throughout the week in that email list. Sometimes I also write fun essays that uh, that the email list gets to see first. Uh, I'm going to be working on a couple of essays this month, so you guys might get you guys might get those sporadically. I might tell a couple of little stories here and there as well. Uh, so yeah, the email list is krishmohanhaha.substack.com, uh, and I will be exclusively, uh, sharing the Rockfin videos instead of the YouTube videos. So, uh, be sure to check those out. Uh, so let's pop over, make, let's see if you guys have additional, uh, comments and such. Cool. Uh, and with all that said, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Uh, Jay, Jim. People's Party, Sarah, WM, Dingo, uh, you guys are uh, ARAM, uh, you guys are all uh, champions and beautiful people in my eyes. Uh, and uh, tomorrow I'll be back, 1230, uh, as per usual. Um, so come, come back, join me. I will have a, a brand new topic of discussion, and we'll do the same thing again.
I might I might be back on YouTube tomorrow. I don't know yet. I got to double check that on the on the back end of my channel. So uh, yeah, uh, thank you guys again, and we'll see you guys soon. Be good to each other, and we'll see you on the road. Bye, guys.